All right, now we're gonna be talking about complex zeros and the fundamental theorem of algebra. So this is basically the last section that we're really gonna be focusing on out of this chapter. And what it does is it brings everything together that we've been going over, such as the remainder theorem, uh, the rational zero theorem, and finally, uh, factorization theory or factorization of polynomials. It's just sometimes polynomials do not have real, uh, real zeros for their solution. Uh, for example, and I'm going to kind of just scroll down here a little bit. Uh, if I if I gave this example right here, and I asked you to factor x squared plus one, all right. Uh, notice here that technically. If I put an equal zero here and I said solve, so in other words, instead of saying uh, factor, if I said solve, you would see that we could solve this. It's just the answers are non or they're not going to be real numbers. So, for example, you would subtract one from both sides. You would take the square root of both sides then. And we find that X would equal plus or minus I. So the idea behind it is if we know that x equals plus or minus i, then according to the remainder theorem, if I had p of x equals x squared plus 1, I could take i and substitute it in to give me uh, the variable squared plus 1, substitute in i. By definition, i squared is negative 1. And negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So, obviously, it's a 0. And then I can also do the same thing again by saying uh, P of negative I equals negative I squared. Well, I'm sorry, negative I plus negative I squared plus 1. And this is still going to be, oops, sorry. This is still going to be 0 as well, which means... If I, if I gave you the original problem back, like I said, which is going to be factor x squared plus 1, then it would factor down into x plus i times x minus i. And this would be its completely factored form. So in the previous three, four sections, we've learned all these techniques to factor polynomials that had real roots now we're just going to extend this into complex roots as well all right so there are two definitions that i want to go over the first one is right here it's the fundamental theorem of algebra and what it says is every polynomial uh will have complex coefficients or with complex coefficients has at least one complex zero now there is one thing we do have to remember complex numbers Uh, I think a better word would be exist as conjugate pairs, meaning it's always going to be a plus or minus bi. So if you find one complex number, you automatically have the other one. They always exist as conjugate pairs. And then the second definition is the complete factorization theorem, which just says if P of X is a polynomial of degree and is greater than or equal to one, then there exist complex numbers, A, C1, C2, all the way up through CN, such that you can write a complete factorized version of P of X. So without really doing anything else, uh, all I got to do is just examples now, just to show you how this works. All right, so here's our example here. We're going to completely factor p of x equals x to the third minus 3x squared plus x minus 3. We want to find all zeros of p and then find oh okay no we're good right here then we want to just completely factor but i wrote it first all right so here we go step one the rational zero theorem says that our possible zeros are going to be 
the ratio of plus or minus 3 over plus or minus 1. And it's going to be the factors of all these. So luckily for us, it's going to be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3. Now, according to the rational, or I'm sorry, according to the remainder theorem, we can find out which one of these is going to be a potential zero. So P of negative three, P of negative one, P of positive one, and P of three, okay? Now to help us, remember, we're gonna uh, go ahead and just use our calculator here. P of negative 3 equals negative 60. Cross it out. And then I'm just going to go ahead and do the rest. our notes p of negative one was negative eight so that's not a zero p of one equals negative four that's not a zero so the only one we found was p of three equals zero but we know we should get three roots so now we can extend our knowledge of polynomials polynomials and say okay well this is the situation that we're currently looking at we have p of three which is a zero we know that this could have a multiplicity of three because remember this is just this is this is a zero we need three of them total so this p of three could have a multiplicity of three which is totally possible or we were we are going to have one real zero, real meaning a real number, and complex conjugate pairs. All right? So like I said, you're going to have one of these two situations, either a multiplicity of three or one real zero, and then the rest of the solutions will be complex conjugates. And the only way that you're going to know is gonna you're gonna have to try it use synthetic division so we're gonna use synthetic division all right now let's go ahead and let's write out the uh the coefficients here so coefficients are going to be one negative three one negative three again let me just verify check one negative three one negative three good copy down to one we already know the remainder is going to be zero all we have to do is go through this just once so Three times one is three. Negative three plus three is zero. Three times zero is zero. One plus zero is one. Three times one is three. And negative three plus three is zero. So we know this is great. Okay? Now, we started off with a third degree polynomial. And now our result with a remainder of zero is a second degree polynomial. And to be honest with you, as soon as you get down to a second degree polynomial after synthetic division, honestly, I would just stop. 
I would write the second degree polynomial out. X squared plus 0x plus 1, which is really just x squared plus 1, and set it equal to 0. Now the reason, we can easily solve this by using factoring, or we can use completing the square, quadratic formula, stuff like that. But this is nice and easy. We're going to subtract 1 from both sides. Let's take the square root of both sides. Make sure you add that plus or minus. And then you get x equals plus or minus i. And here are the other zeros to our polynomial. It just so happens they're complex. So p of x equals x to the third minus 3x to the second plus x minus 3 factors into p of x equals our real 0, x minus 3, and then our complex, x plus i and x minus i. All right? And you can always check yourself if you wanted to. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just multiply it out. So in red, I'll show you the check. All right, so here, here's what's nice about this. On the right-hand side, these are conjugate pairs. All right, which means when you multiply them out, all you have to multiply are the x's and then the i's. So you're going to get x minus 3 times x plus i, x minus i. Let's multiply the conjugate pairs first. You're going to get x squared minus 1. Because remember, I'll do it off to the right-hand side here. Since they're conjugate pairs, you get x times x. And then positive i times negative i is going to be minus i squared. Oh, this is a positive one. And by definition, i squared is negative 1. So you get x squared plus 1. Now, we're going to have to go ahead and distribute x minus 3 to x squared plus 1. So that's going to give us x to the third plus x minus 3x squared minus 3. And just by arranging this in descending order, we get the original polynomial, which is what we wanted. That is everything in a nutshell, to be completely honest with you. Every single problem is going to have the same exact approach. It's just you're going to have to try to be more investigative in the sense that you may not have real zeros for a solution. You may have complex. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and let's uh, let's look at another one here. All right. So here's an example. We're going to completely we'll do the same thing. Completely factor. P of x equals x to the third minus 2x plus 4. So remember, step one, rational zero theorem. We want the ratio of the factors of the leading coefficient and uh, in the constant term. So this is going to give us plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4. Okay? Step two, we're going to use that remainder theorem again. And I like to show you various ways to do this. So I think maybe the best way to show this one would be, uh, let's go ahead and use Desmos. So let me uh, click over on the Desmos. So you can
So according to the remainder theorem, this is our only real zero. And that, that word real means everything to us right now, okay? So step three, we're going to use synthetic division to find the other zeros, okay? Now, we got to be careful because when I go ahead and set this up, this is really P of X equals X to the third plus zero X squared minus two X plus four. So my coefficients are going to be one, zero, negative two, and four respectively. All right, so I drop this down. I know my remainder will be zero. And we're just going to synthetically divide because we have a third degree polynomial. And we, we need to know what is that second degree polynomial. So negative two times one is negative two. Zero plus negative two is negative two. Negative two times negative two is positive four. Negative two plus four is two. And then negative two times two is negative four. Four plus, or four plus negative four is zero, so that's great. Here's our second degree polynomial, and it's gonna be x squared minus two x plus two. And then we go ahead and set it equal to zero. And I'm not gonna waste any time at all. I'm gonna go ahead and just use my quadratic formula. So I get x equals negative b plus or minus the square root. I guess maybe I'll write the formula out so everybody can see it. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So then this is going to give me x equals a negative negative 2 plus or minus negative 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 2, all over 2 times 1. So that gives 2 plus or minus the square root. So the discriminant underneath is going to be 4 minus 8, which is going to be negative 4, all over 2. And that simplifies down into x equals 2 plus or minus 2i over 2. And then finally, I can simplify this in its last form to be 1 plus or minus i. And here are my complex zeros. So when I go ahead and completely factor, I get x equals, I'm sorry, p of x equals the quantity of x minus negative 2. There's my real zero that we found earlier. And then we get x minus the quantity 1 plus i and x minus the quantity 1 plus minus i. And if you wanted to, just to clean this up, you can write x the quantity x plus 2, then x minus 1 minus i, and x minus 1 plus i. And that's going to be it for this example. Okay, so I think we've done enough of these synthetic division, factoring, polynomial things that we, we've done of maybe we're experts at it by now, and I hope so. The last example I'm going to do is this is going to be a little bit different in the sense that I want you to find a polynomial, name it P of X, with degree 4, that has the following zeros. All right, so here's our zeros right here. C equals I, 2, negative 2, with a point 3, comma, 25. Okay? Now, here's what I want. I want the answer P of X equals our factored form, okay? And I gave you all the information you need for this. So for example, here's the information right here. And I want a degree of four. So I know this has to be x to the fourth, okay? It's just, what does this look like? Well, we need to go back and think about everything that we've learned. 
And one of those things that we learned was x minus c is a factor to p of x, which means I can rewrite every single one of these as x minus i, x minus 2, and x plus 2. But there's something I'm missing here. In fact, there's two things. First, and I'm going to erase, so I hope you're not writing in pen. I should have, I should have said something. First, we have no idea if there is a leading coefficient out front. So we got to include this letter A right here because there could, there could be, all right? Second, earlier I mentioned all conjugates exist as, I'm sorry, all complex roots exist as conjugate pairs. So if I'm telling you right here that C equals I, then I have negative I automatically. Therefore, my setup is going to be P of X equals A times X plus I x minus i, x minus 2, and x plus 2. And I also want this to go through the point 3 comma 25. Okay? So all we have to do here is just distribute everything here on the left-hand side, gather our like terms, and then we're going to substitute the point in to solve for a. Watch how this works out. It's beautiful. First, I know, and I'm going to highlight here for us, x plus i, x minus i, conjugate pairs. x minus 2, x plus 2, conjugate pairs. So we can easily write this as x squared plus 1 when we go ahead and expand x plus i and x minus i. And then... We get x squared minus 4 when we go ahead and expand x minus 2, x plus 2, because like I said, they're conjugate pairs. Then, p of x is going to equal a, and I'm going to go ahead and expand this even further. x squared times x squared is x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus x squared minus 4. And then I'm going to group any like terms I have x to the fourth minus 3x squared minus 4. And then finally, I can solve for a because the point was 3 comma 25. So this is going to be 25 equals 3. Oops, sorry. 25 equals a times 3 to the fourth minus 3 times 3 squared minus 4. And if we've done this correctly, that's going to give me a equals one half. Okay? a equals one half. So my completely factored form in the polynomial that I'm looking for, p of x equals one half times x to the fourth minus 3x squared minus 4. All right. Now to check yourself, the easiest way is just go ahead and graph it.